On Wednesday night, we are in a study on the doctrine of predestination, and we go into various areas uh, of the of the doctrines, and we're particularly addressing right now, we're addressing some of the uh, oppositions, what people think are apparent oppositions, to the word predestinate. Uh, there's a book that uh, everybody needs to get. It's called Reprobation Asserted by John Bunyan. John Bunyan was very famous for writing Pilgrim's Progress, but he was a preacher of predestination. He spent 12 years in prison for preaching what I'm preaching, the doctrines of predestination and the sovereignty of God. And uh, you have two types of people, and he addresses uh, the one type in this book. You've got two types of people in the world. You have the elect, you have the elect, and you have the uh, those who are not elect, or you could call them non-elect, elect. And the elect, uh, of course, the word elect is eclectos, E-K-L-E-K-T-O-S. And that word means to favor or to choose, to favor or choose. Now, man does not choose himself to go to heaven. Predestination is true. The verse we use is Romans 8 and 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he be the firstborn among many brethren. God has predestined us to be conformed to the likeness of Jesus. Predestination is about our accountability and God calling us to responsibility. That's what it's about. It's not just predestined to go to heaven no matter what you do. No, predestination is about our accountability in conforming to the likeness of Jesus and going all the way to heaven, and he's the one that's going to perform it. Now, whenever I recommend a book, I don't recommend everything a man says. Uh, Mr. Bunyan was a common man's preacher. Now, whenever you think that uh, you're... I've had people come up after I preach certain messages, they'll say, I feel like a vessel of wrath. I just feel like... I don't know why God would save me. Well, you're in good shape when you feel that way. If you ever feel like a vessel of mercy and say, I feel worthy, boy, you're really in trouble then. And uh, Mr. Bunyan had a... He's got a book uh, called... Uh, well, I... It, eluded me. No. Grace Abounding. He's got a book called Grace Abounding. And in Grace Abounding, he talks about what a slug sinner he was and how that even after he came to the knowledge of Christ, because he was such a, just a worthless, evil man, he kept saying, I just kept worrying about God, would you save me? Why would you save me? I've been so low down and so worthless. And he's probably written one of the most famous books in the history of Christianity when he wrote Pilgrim's Progress. And let me read just a little bit to you out of this about reprobation asserted. Now, what he's saying, he said, it is an assertive fact that, that certain men are reprobate. And what he means by that, that's the non-elect. These people are ordained for destruction they are the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction in Romans 9 and verse 22. They're the same men when the Scripture says in Proverbs 16 and 4, The Lord hath made all things for himself, yea, even the wicked for the day of evil. They are the wicked for the day of evil in Proverbs 16 and 4. They are the wicked made for the day of evil. They're, there so, they're those same men in the second chapter of Second Peter where the Bible speaks all the way through that chapter about certain men that uh, are, came, are come into the kingdom and they sit down and feast with us. They're the same ones that Jude says there are certain men crept in unawares. They're before of old ordained to this condemnation. There in Second Peter 2, they're called natural brute beast and they're made to be taken and destroyed. These are the reprobates of the world. And, of course, the word reprobate is the word A-D-O-K-I-M-A-S, adokimas. And reprobate was a type of silver, silver that they did not use because it had not been put into the fire. It meant no fire. And that was a, that was a silver that it hadn't been tried in the fire. Whenever you dig ore out of the ground, you have to put it into a furnace and you have to turn the heat up. And as you turn the heat up, 
it burns out all the lesser metals, and what is left is the silver or the gold. Well, reprobate comes from the word D-O-K-I-M-A-Z-O. That means to try or test. Test or put into a fire. Placing the alpha, the first letter of the Greek alphabet, as a negative particle in front of the word. It negates the word, gives an opposite meaning. Placing the alpha as the alpha privative, it, it negates the word and translates adokimas or reprobate. It means no fire. So the men who believe that they don't have to go through fiery trials and they don't go through the fiery trials of God. Now, I'm not saying they don't go through problems in life and lose their house and get fired from their job. But when it comes to the fiery trials of God to mold them into the likeness of Christ, they're not going to be. Let me read to you just a little bit out of Mr. Uh, Bunyan's book on reprobation asserted. Now, I, I don't agree with every point. I've got other books by men on predestination. I've got one called Genuine Salvation by Arthur Pink. I've got all kinds of books at home, but these are some of my favorites. And everybody ought to get The Sovereignty of God by Arthur Pink. That's a great book. And then Absolute Predestination by uh, Jerome Zanchius. That's a favorite of mine right there. And then you've got one called The Five Points of Calvinism by William Parks here. And then, of course, last but not least in any measure is the great work, probably the most famous book that was written by any uh, scholarly man over the last thousand years is The Bondage of the Will by Martin Luther. That one will break your mind when you read that. These are men who believe, people say, Jim Brown's by himself. Nobody else believes that. I think we've heard of of uh, John Bunyan. I think we've heard of Martin Luther and some of these, and John Calvin and and John Bunyan. Let me read to you a little bit out of the reprobation asserted. It's an assertive fact that God has got certain people he does not love, and they're not going to heaven. To be reprobate is to be disapproved, void of judgment and rejected. To be disapproved, that is, when the word condemns them, either as touching the faith or the holiness of the gospel, the which they must needs be that are void of spiritual and heavenly judgment in the mysteries of the kingdom. A manifest token, they are rejected. The, and he, then he goes into the eternal invisible reprobation. We can't tell who is reprobate and who are vessels of mercy only by uh, watching their actions. It's invisible to us until we watch their actions because we're predestined to conform to the image of the likeness of Jesus. It is to be passed by in, he says, the eternal reprobation which I shall thus hold forth, it is to be passed by in or left out of God's election, yet so as considered upright. In which position you have these four things considerable. The act of God's election, the negative of that act, the persons reached by that negative, and their qualification which thus, when thus reached by that. Notice what he said, the persons reached by the negative action of election. In other words, these men have a purpose, these vessels of wrath. They're reached by God's negative action. The act of God in electing, it is a choosing or foreappointing of some infallibly unto eternal life, which he hath also determined shall be brought to pass by the means that should be made manifest and efficacious to that very end. Now, the negative of this act is a passing by or a leaving of those not concerned in this act. A leaving of them, I say, without the bounds. And what's the bound of God? Horizo, horizo. And pro horizo is the word predestinate. So they're left outside the bound of the horizo. And horizo is the word, our word horizon, or they're left outside the light or the truth. That's what they're left out of. Then he says, Wherefore, as I said before, those not contained within this blessed act 
are called the rest. We are the elect of God and everyone else, and that's the few, and everyone else is the rest besides the election. The persons then that are contained under the negative of this act, they are those and those only that pass through this wicked world without the saving grace of God's elect. And that's the truth. (coughs) Reprobation is God's act. Even the negative of his choosing or election. It is the exact opposite. Consider a little and you shall see that these three things do necessarily fall in to complete the potter's action in every pot he makes. And he's talking about Romans 9 where the Bible says when Rebekah had conceived by one even by her father Isaac for the children being not yet born neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to election, might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. And then he talks about these two through the rest of the chapter, and particularly down in verse 20, 21, where he says, Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump, speaking of the womb of of Rebekah, and these twins coming out of the womb, Jacob and Esau, hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? Now, Mr. Bunyan is referring to these vessels, and the Scripture says in the 64th Psalm, in verse 8, that... Thou art the potter, we are the clay, and we are all the work of thy hand. Man is not the work of his own hand or his own will. Then he speaks of this, and he says, Consider, to complete the potter's action in every pot he makes, he does his will. Number one, a determination in his own mind what pot to make of this or that piece of clay. A determination, I say, precedent to the fashion of the pot. It's something the potter determines before the pot comes into being. (coughs) The which is true in the highest degree. In him that is excellent in working, he determines the end before the beginning is perfected. Then he sits, he quotes from Exodus uh, 9, 16, for this cause have I raised you up, Pharaoh, that I might show my power in thee. The next thing considerable, number two, in the potter, is it is the so making of the pot, even as he determined a vessel to honor or a vessel to dishonor. There is no confusion nor disappointment under the hand of this eternal God. He's not confused as how it's turning out. He doesn't wake up one day, I'm surprised, this turned out to be evil. God God is not caught by surprise by anything. He doesn't wake up one day and say, oh goodness, what's happening here? Nothing surprises God. God is never surprised at anything because he does everything. There is no confusion nor disappointment under the hand of this eternal God His work is perfect, and he's talking about the vessels of wrath just as well. In every way doth answer to what he hath determined. Observe again, I like this, listen to this. Observe again, that whether the vessel be to honor or to dishonor, yet the potter makes it good, sound, and fit for the service. He's not just talking about vessels of mercy, he's talking about vessels of wrath as well. And listen to the statement again. Whether the vessel be to honor or dishonor, the potter makes it good. He makes the vessel of wrath or the pot, the piece of pottery that's fit for destruction. He makes it good, sound, and fit for its service so it can go to hell and serve God in his wrath. Boy, that's something people don't like. His foredetermining to make this vessel to dishonor 
hath no persuasion at all with him to break or mar the pot. He doesn't say it's got a glitch in it. It's got an imperfection. I need to mar it and start over again. He says, no, it's good. It's a vessel of wrath. It's going to punish my vessels of mercy and whip them. And I'm going to raise it up as a sword. Ah, I've got this one good too. And I'll destroy it in my wrath and my rage. It is exactly what I want. That's something that people don't like. Which very thing doth well resemble the state of man as under the act of eternal reprobation. That's what God does, Mr. Bunyan says. I may come back and read some more next week out of the next chapter. That's good. I like that. Now, the question that most people say, even though that the Bible says in Romans 9, 22, that God's got vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, everyone says, yes, but... What about John 3, 16? And, and, and what about over there, wherever that is, uh, somewhere it doesn't say God's not willing that anybody should perish? No, it doesn't say that. It says that in the English text. It didn't say that in the original text. And John 3, 16 does not say what men think it says. They believe that man can choose to come to God. Man cannot choose to come to God. God's got his eternal work fitted and fixed uh, for the vessels of wrath and for the vessels of mercy. I was talking to somebody the other day about this doctrine. They said, but no one is preaching this. I haven't heard anybody else. I was thinking it was the guy in Tulsa who jumped all over me for preaching predestination. And he was talking about there was free will. And then he went and researched and he came back. And he said, you're right. I was wrong. And he said, but nobody else is talking about this. I said, you're right. But it's the truth. Predestination is true, vessels of wrath. Everyone in the world, everyone in the world, wherever they sit or stand or sleep right now, whatever they're doing, regardless of where they are, everyone in the world is either an elect vessel of mercy or they a vessel of wrath. Now, mine and your job is one thing. We preach the truth to everyone. We've been accused of not evangelizing. Are you kidding? I preach more than anybody I've ever known. I preach on the streets. I preach in Kmart. I preach down at the grocery store. I preach to the druggist. I preach to the doctors. The doctors hate to see me come in their office. God correcting them, talking about Christmas and the pagan origins of Christmas and predestination, repent. What do you call that? But it's not my job to convert anyone. The spirit quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing in John 6, 63. Flesh can't profit anything in the kingdom. God's got them fixed. Our job is to preach. Here's what we do. Here's the elect. Here's the vessels of wrath. You only got these two. Are the vessels of mercy. The elect is the vessels of mercy. And the vessels of wrath... Those, that have, those are the ones that have no chance. The vessels of wrath are the majority of the world. Many are going to find the broad gate, and few, that's the elect, are going to find the narrow gate. Here you are. You're preaching. This is what you do. A lot of people don't understand this. And here's your mouth, and you preach. And the Word covers everybody you preach to, doesn't it? It goes into the ear of the vessel of wrath. It goes into the ear of the vessel of mercy. But only the vessels of mercy, Proverbs 20 and 12, Proverbs 20 and 12 says, The hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord hath made even both of them, and God has deafened the ears of certain ones. We preached that a couple of weeks ago. So as you preach, these people, these elect are vessels of wrath. The elect are like a Polaroid camera. Polaroid camera. They're like the film in the camera. It, when you preach, it only takes on the elect. It does not take here. They can't hear. They're vessels of wrath fitted for destruction. So the call went to all of them, didn't it? But the only ones that hear are the elect. And that's all that we'll hear. 
Yeah, many are called, but few are elect. Ekloge. You got three words there that are related to that word elect. If I, you have the word ekloge, eklegomai, and eklektos. E-K-L-E-G-O-M-A-I. All of these are from the same base words. E-K-L-E-K-T-O-S. And the word ekloge. A-E-K-L-O-G-E. All these come from a word that means chosen, chosen, or favored. Favored. God says, have not I chosen you twelve? And one of you is a devil there in, the, in those last few verses of John, the sixth chapter. He said, I've chosen all of you for a particular work. Judas, just like Mr. Bunyan says, I've created you perfect and complete for the work that you will do your vessel of wrath. I've got this for you to do and you will do it. And God arranged it in his heart. And he was... Perfected by God for that work. The negative of the elect. That's who, that's who will hear. And that's all that will hear. Now let's go back to John 3.16. I am talking about John 3.16. That's the verse that everybody wants to say. Well God loves everybody in the world. And it doesn't say that. I, I don't know if I'm going to get to. I said I was going to get to 2 Peter 3 and 9. Not willing that any should perish. It doesn't say not willing that any should perish in the original text. It says not willing that any of us. And that's the elect of God. Now, man can't choose God. John 15, 16 says, Jesus tells the apostles, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. And I've ordained you to go forth and bring forth much fruit. You did not choose me. He's chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. 2 Thessalonians 2.13, We are bound to give thanks all the way to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through a method, through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Now back to John 3. I'm going to try to cover some territory here I haven't covered with you. Not in a long time. John 3. John 3, 16 does not say that God loves everybody in the world. Let's read it one more time. This is the most famous Bible verse in the world. There's not a verse quoted more than this. Somebody's telling me that that guy that sat at the end of the football field with John 3, 16, uh, right behind the goalpost and at the baseball games, he went to prison for... What was it he did? Something, somebody told me he went to prison recently. Stealing something. Kidnapping. Kidnapping. That's it. Got John 3.16 out there. He evidently didn't know what it was. He's trying to win the world for Christ, and then he ended up kidnapping somebody and going to prison. Now, let's read it. For God so loved the world. Now, there is where people say, see, God loves everybody in the world. It does not say that. The little word so puts a whole new light on all of this. So, that's, that's an unbelievable condition that puts on. So, God did, God did not love all the world. He so loved. So loved. So is an adverb. Adverb. It is the word O-U-T-O. There's an H sound there. It's huta. It's the word huta, and it's an adverb. I keep saying this. It's, this is a little ninth grade English lesson. Uh, adverbs tell how, when, where, and why. How, when, where, and why. They modify verbs. This verbs, adjectives, other adverbs. This modifies the verb loved. It's what it modifies. It puts a condition on the word loved. Now, loved is that word A-G-A-P-E-O, agapao. That is the verb form of the word agape. That is the same word, Jacob have I loved. Jacob 
have I loved? God only loves Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. Israel is now spiritual. We are spiritual Israel, circumcised of the heart. Uh, 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 Romans uh, 2 and 25. Uh, Paul tells the Philippians in Philippians 3 and 3, we are the circumcision. Me and you Gentile church at Philippi, we are the circumcision that worship God in spirit and have no confidence in the flesh. That's us. Circumcision was a term or a title for the Jews or the Israelites. So when the Bible says, Jacob have I loved, that and Esau I have I hated before either one were born, before either one had done any good or evil, being the same word in John 3, 16, God only loves Jacob because he only so loved the world. So being an adverb tells how or in what fashion he loved. He only loves Israel in the world. I like, uh, Mike said he had a, uh, uh, oh, oh, it was, uh, it was uh, Jeff. Jeff said he had a screensaver up at work, and it says God, lo God loves only Israel. And somebody come complaining, well, now, we don't like that. You need to take that off the screen. That, that defends us. Well, that's all he loves is Israel, his Israel, not literal Israel, but his Israel, the church, the believers. That's all he loves. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. So God so loved. And the Bible says that the ones that he loves are agapes. And let me say one more time. What is agape? Second John 6. 6. Herein is agape that we walk after his commandments. Agape is a relationship that a father has for his family. Was not Jacob a family of 12? And did he not have 12 sons? And did they not become the nation of Israel? And was his name not changed to Israel to prevail with God? So here's the family. Here is the kingdom. Agape was a relationship that a father had for his sons. They, he gave them commandments. They willingly walked in them. And he had an affection for them. And they had an affection for him. Now, if he, if he loves Jacob, and the scripture says, Jacob have a love. And if God so loved the world, he eliminates Esau with the word so. He doesn't love Esau. He hated Esau before he was born. He hated Ishmael before he was born. He, before Isaac was born, it was prophesied to Abraham uh, in the 15th chapter of Genesis, you'll have a son, and it will not be this Eliezer, this Syrian, even though you love him and he loves you, it will be one out of your own bowels. So he goes, Abraham goes and helps God with his promise by going into the Egyptian handmaiden Hagar, and she has a son and calls him Ishmael. And then 14 years later, a few months more or less, uh, 14 years later, he has the promised son of Isaac, and the scripture says, In Isaac shall thy seed be called. This is the one that I promised you before he was born. Ishmael was, re was rejected as the non-elect before he was born, and before either one of, es uh, of Isaac and Ishmael were born, God had predestined and preordained Isaac to be his son, hadn't he? So it's not a matter of choice. There's no choice involved in this. God does not love everybody in the world. He so loved. And the scripture says in Hebrews, the 12th chapter, that everyone he loves... He chastens and scourges, and that word is agapao. That's the word agapao. So everyone he loves, he chastens. That's Jacob, not Esau. Esau does not get the chastening of God. Now, when, when somebody comes up and says, well, he just loved Esau less. What is, it? What is agape? Walking his commandments. Esau's descendants were the people of Edom, the people of Petra, where they built a, a stone mountain just south of the Dead Sea. God never gave these people the laws. If he loved Esau less, then he would have, and love is agape, walking in the commandments. That means he gives Esau less commandments than Jacob, right? He only gets three of the commandments. Thou shalt have no other gods before me, and thou shalt not covet. 
and honor thy father and thy mother. Now, you can make some graven images, Esau, and you can, and you can uh, uh, steal, and you can lie. Uh, I'm, all, I'm loving you less. I'm giving you less commandments. That's not true. He didn't love Esau at all. He gave him none of his commandments. The only people he gives his commandments to is Israel, his church. Now, it's not everybody in the world that he loved. Let me go into this one more time. So he so loved, or he so gave his agape, his commandments, to the world. He so loved the world. The world. The world. The word world is cosmos. Now, cosmos means orderly arrangement. Now, he so loved the cosmos. And of course, here's the thing. When you get an interlinear Bible, where's my interlinear? When you get an interlinear and you get, uh, you learn to look up the word. Mr. Strong, when you look up something in Strong's, you got masculine, feminine, neuter gender in the singular, masculine, feminine, neuter gender in the plural, then you have the nominative, dative, uh, dative, uh, genitive, dative, and accusative case. Genitive, dative, and accusative. Nominative is the subject of the sentence or the predicate nominative. Genitive shows possession. Dative is the indirect object, and accusative is the direct object. When you look up something in Strong's, he only gives you singular, masculine, gender, nominative case. When you look up world, it puts it here because he doesn't have place in his concordance to give you all these other 23 definitions. You got 24 different ways to spell the word cosmos. And being the accusative case, being in the accusative case, God loved the world World is accusative case. It's the direct object. The direct object receives the action of the subject through the verb. So loved the world. It's the direct object is what it is. When you look it up in your concordance, instead of being Mr. Strong just gives you nominative, masculine, and singular, you'll find it down here. Nominative, masculine, and singular is cosmos. R-K-O-S-M-O-S. In the accusative case of the direct object, it's spelled K-O-S-M-O-N. Or let's put it in the Greek, K-O-S-M-O-N. It's actually... K-O-S-M-O-N. So let's, let's put it the way it is in the interlinear Bible. K-O-S-M-O-N. And you get your, your letters from up here. And it means an orderly arrangement. But when you change the word ending, this gives you something about the character. The word cosmon is actually singular, masculine gender. Gender. And of course, the, the definite article, the, is T O N, or T O N, in the English. It's ton cosmon, or the orderly arrangement of mankind, is what it means. And it means there is one singular orderly arrangement. And the word, that's the word cosmos. Well, let me give you something else concerning the word cosmos. Let me give you some other words that this comes from. I'm going to give you this right here. You've got several words that come from the word cosmos. You have the word cosmeo. It means to put properly or to decorate. What do you think of when you see cosmeo? Cosmetic. Let me read to you cosmetic out of Webster's Dictionary, okay? Cosmetic, Webster's Dictionary. Comes from the Greek cosmikos, 
Skilled in arranging or cosmine to arrange, to adorn, or cosmos. It tells you under cosmetic, the word cosmetic comes from the word cosmos, which means to arrange in an orderly fashion. When a woman puts on her face, she arranges her face, doesn't she? That's right. Some of them need another face. Don't they? Beautifying, especially that woman up there at the Devil's Broadcasting Network. <laughs> She tried to fix her one, didn't she? She built her one. Beautifying or designed to beautify the complexion hair for improving the appearance by the removal or correction of blemishes or deformities or for the improving of the appearance. It's basically an orderly arrangement. Let me read to you Cosmos, C-O-S-M-O-S, -O -S -S, out of, out of the... Uh, out of the Webster's Dictionary. It comes from the Greek cosmos, which is the same word world in John 3, 16. It means a universe or a harmony, an orderly system, any complete or orderly system. And it goes on to give you some other. So it's an orderly arrangement. It's what it is. Let me give you a couple other words here. Then you have the word kosmikos, K-O-S, K-O-S, M-I-K-O-S. The word means the terrain of the world. It's the terrain. And that is an orderly arrangement, isn't it? The terrain uh, means cosmic. We get the word cosmic from that. Cosmic. Then, uh, then you've got, let me just give you something that's kind of interesting that would go. You have the word Cosmocrator, K-O-S-M-O-K-R-A-T-O-R. That is the word world ruler. The ruler of the darkness of this world is Cosmocrator. Crator comes from kratos, meaning strength of the cosmos. Now, I might just give you a couple other words that have to do with decorating. You have the word komeo, K-O-M-A-O. That word means to wear tresses of long hair. What do you think of when you think of komeo? Comb. We got our word comb from that. Then you have the word kome. Oops, wait a minute. K O M E. And that means the hair of the head, the hair. We get our word comb from these words. All these go together. Then you have the word komezo. K O M I Z O. That word means to, it actually means to uh, tend to, to tend. To tend or provide for, uh, or to bring. And this is the word that's used in 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, the word komedzo, when the Bible says that it's a shame, uh, does not nature itself teach you that it's a shame if man have long hair? Well, it's not the word long. It's not the word long. Long, long hair would be what kind of hair, and that would be an adverb. But if, when you look this up in the interlinear Bible, the word long is the word komedzo, and it means it's a verb, and here's one of the mistakes that they made in the King James Bible. You can't take an adverb and translate it, uh, you can't take a verb and translate it over into an adverb, can you? Oh, adjective, excuse me, that's right. What kind of? That's right. Yeah, what kind of? To an adjective. Excuse me. Thank you, English teacher. Adjective. Tells which or what kind of or how many. And this tells what kind of hair. It's long hair. But it doesn't say that in the, in the Greek. It says komedzo. It means to lengthen the hair or to adorn the hair. Now, why is it a shame for man to adorn the hair? Does anybody remember? 
because the woman because the woman had her hair cut into a fashion where she could adorn her hair and she could tie her dowry into her hair and that way if her husband came in and said I divorce you then she would have to leave without any kind of divorce settlement without any property and she could only leave with what she had on her body and the whole context of that first Corinthians the 11th chapter is about the head of the man is Christ the head of the woman is the man and the woman has to cover her head or adorn her hair because she can't trust her head man man would not have his hair adorned because he can trust his head Christ who will not cut him off. And I just thought I'd throw that in. Because when we're talking about. When we're talking about. Come Or comezo. And this goes along with this. Or cosmikos. Or com- cosmeo. Let me give you a couple of these words. Okay. And I'm trying. To, the point I'm trying to bring out to you. Is that the word world. In John 3.16. It means the adornment of God in the universe. The orderly arrangement of God. Is what it means. Doesn't mean what people say it means. Look over here in, look over here in uh, Titus two, in verse twelve. Go to. I'm going to give you this, and I want you to see that this is here is the word cosmikos. Cosmikos, and that's an adornment uh, in Titus two and twelve. Titus two and twelve. Titus 2, first and take it to Titus, 2 and verse 12. Well, let's read 11 and 12. For the grace of God which bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men. There's the word all from John 3, 16, pos. That word is pos, or pos. There's the Greek, here's the English way you would spell it. And it means the whole of something in its singular masculine gender. That's the same word. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever. Whosoever, it's not the word whosoever. The word whosoever, we connect that with will usually. Whosoever will may come. I hate that song. May gives permission and can means ability. We always used to ask Ms. Redding in high school, my senior teacher, can I do this? She'd say, I don't know, can you? I mean, may I do it? Permission. Where was I? I was giving you something. Oh, whosoever will. So, may come, not may come. The Bible doesn't say whosoever will may come. The Bible says in Revelation, the 22nd chapter. Look at that real quick, and we'll come back to this. Hold your place right here in Titus. Revelation, the 22nd chapter. Now, this is where everybody gets the whosoever will may come, except it doesn't say that. Verse 17. And the Spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that heareth, akuo, A-K-O-U-O is the word heareth. And remember Proverbs 20 and 12, the, the hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord has made even both of them. Well, if, the, if God has made the hearing ear, then only, ones, only the elect who he's given ears to hear, and he's deafened the ears of the other, as we said in a message two weeks ago, only ones that are going to hear are the ones he's given hearing ears, which is the elect. He has not given vessels of wrath or the non-elect ears to hear, has he? And let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will. Well, that's not the word. It does, doesn't say that in the Greek text. It says, the willing. That's what it says. It says, the willing. Well, where does a man get his will? 
Psalms 110.3, Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. Thy people, that's a possessive pronoun. He owns them. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. So where does a man get his will? He gets it from God. We were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Man's new birth did not come out by his will. This does not say whosoever will may come. This says the willing, let him take. It's third person singular. It's an imperative mood. It's a command. Everyone who has ears to hear, everyone who has received the will from me, I'm commanding you, take this. Let him take the water of life freely. It doesn't say, whosoever will may come. Whosoever will can come. No, it doesn't say that at all. You're not even permitted to come in the condition you're in. God has to make you alive before you can come to Him. Now, one other thing before I go back to Titus. Another verse that everyone tries to use. To go to the Revelation, the third chapter, on your way back to Titus. <laughs> on your way back to Titus. Here's another verse that everybody thinks says you have to let Jesus into your heart. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. <clears throat> Verse 20, 320, behold, I stand at the door and knock if, well, you've got various translations, the word if, the word is E-A-N, E-A-N, it also means except or when, let's put that in there because this is just the translator's mistake. Not if you will, but when any man hear my voice. Let me ask you again. Who is going to hear? He, the Lord told Isaiah, Isaiah the 6th chapter. He said, I'll, he said, I want you to go preach to Israel. And I'm going to deafen their ears. They can't hear. I'm going to blind their eyes. They can't see. Lest they should be converted. And I should heal them. And he repeats that over in the 13th chapter of Matthew. He repeats it in the, uh, the 28th chapter of Acts. He repeats it over in the 11th chapter of Romans. I don't want them. They don't belong to me. If any man hear my voice, or when any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Here's the question. Who is Jesus talking to here? He's not talking to men outside the kingdom. These are, are letters to seven churches that are apostate. He's talking to an apostate church. This is not a method of salvation. That's not what it's talking about. If you back up there in verse 14, look at verse 13. He that hath ear... He that hath an ear, let him hear. That's third person singular, imperative mood. Well, who's going to hear? The one with hearing ears and the seeing eye. Isaiah said, he wakeneth mine ear to hear every morning. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, write. And he tells him, write this down and tell them that I would that you were hot or cold. If you're lukewarm, I'll vomit you out of my mouth in the next two verses. And he said, you say I'm rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. He's talking to a church. He's not talking to unbelievers. He's talking to a church that's gone by the wayside, the way of the world. And then he tells the Laodicean church, I counsel thee. God doesn't counsel any vessels of wrath to come to truth, does he? He's not talking to vessels of wrath. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in a fire, that thou mayest be rich in white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eyesab, that thou mayest see as many as I love Laodicean apostate church. 
I rebuke and chasten, and I'm going to chasten you, and now I'm commanding you. I stand at the door and knock. When you, when any man hears my voice, not if any man's going to hear my voice, what's the word hear? Akuo. Who can hear? The ones who's been given hearing ears. And he commands us every time you find the words, let him hear. That's an imperative command. Yeah. He's not, he's not talking to vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. He's talking to an apostate church saying, I'm going to rebuke you. I'm going to chasten you and scourge you. And you will hear me. Don't you tell your kids that? You will hear this belt. Isn't that what you tell them? You didn't listen to my voice, but you will hear me before this is over with. Have you ever said that to you kids? Huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, have an affection. And then he says, if any man will hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him, sup with him, and he with me. And then he says to him that overcometh, to the man at Laodicea that overcometh, will I grant to sit with me in the throne. And the word overcome, what's the word overcome? N-I-K-A-I-O-O, that's the verb form. That's the verb form of N-I-K-E. That is, in Nike is the word victory. Overcome, the man who overcomes has a victory. And what is the victory that overcomes? Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. And faith is the gift of God to everyone that he can hear because God gives them the hearing ear. Now go back to Titus. In verse 12, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. The worldly lust is an arrangement, isn't it? Huh? If it's not an arrangement, it's not, if it's not arranged, it's not going to appeal to your eye. If you see, uh, if you had lust after a woman, if she's got her body sideways and her head is attached to her feet and her no what you like about it is the way she's arranged you like the way that diamond is cut the way it's arranged and the way it sparkles the world has an orderly arrangement that word that word worldly lust is the word cosmikos it comes from the word cosmos it's an arrangement look look here in uh, let's go to first timothy 2 and 9 cosmios Cosmeo, it comes from Cosmeo, or it's Cosmeos. Look here. In 1 Timothy 2, we're talking about the world being an orderly arrangement. I've had people fight me over the word world. It don't mean orderly arrangement. What it certainly does, that's the definition. You could look it up in, you could look up cosmos or cosmetic in Webster's Dictionary and then go over there in your concordance and all the other books that you have on Greek come over to my house and we'll take out about 15 Greek books and we'll see that in every one of them it says an orderly arrangement. Had a guy in prison out here one time I was sending tapes to a friend of mine out there and he gave some of these tapes on Cosmos and he was a Church of Christ and boy it made him so mad boy and he would just write me these scathing letters just burning me you know. Well it don't mean that it means world. How stupid. Well, I'm a Church of Christ and I've never seen any reason to look up Greek words before. That's why you don't know anything. Where did I say go to? 1 Timothy 2. 1 Timothy 2. When a, man, when a woman fixes her face. Verse 9. In like manner also that the women adorn themselves in modest. The word, the word, uh, the word modest is the word is the word cosmeos. It has, we, uh, she adorns herself, and the word adorn comes from this same word, cosmeo. So she puts on an orderly arrangement of godliness. You say, how should we dress? Well, first of all, when someone comes up and they say, well, you women wearing them uh, pants. Uh, 
Ah, uh, yeah, wearing them pants and wearing them men's clothing. Stupid, stupid, stupid. Pantaloons were not invented till the 1700s. I'm not sorry to tell you this, but uh, nobody was wearing pants in the first century. <laughs> That's so funny. And whenever the Lord would tell the men and the women, gird up your loins, they all wore a skirt or a dress. The only difference between the men's dress and the women's dress was the size of the sashes, the colors that they wore. What he's just saying is don't like a woman, look like a woman when you go out in the world. That's what he's saying. And when they would gird up their loins, they'd pull their skirts up, tie them back into a big diaper, shorts, and go out in the fields and work. And I used to hear my father's an independent Baptist preacher, and him and his friends would get together, and they'd say, why are they wearing them shorts? You look out there on the clothesline, and got those pedal pushers or those clothespins. They don't, they don't have pedal pushers anymore, but they were pants in 1951 52 and they came down to women right there and they and one preacher said well they look like a bunch of clothespins that's not what this is talking about men and women both wore wore shorts when they girded up their loins and they both wore dresses during the day so what are you going to do about that huh if it's wrong for women to wear pants, it's wrong for men to wear pants. We all need to start wearing dresses, long ones. <laughs> what, would, what would they think about us if we walked around the streets out here? <laughs> they would think we was out of our minds, wouldn't they? Yeah. Look at, look at 1 Timothy 3 and 2. 1 Timothy 3. 3 and verse 2. <clears throat> And that we may be delivered from the unreasonable and... Wait a minute. That's not 1 Timothy. That's 2 Thessalonians. It sounded like it. 1 Timothy uh, 3 and verse 2. A bishop then must be blameless. A, a one-woman man is what that says in the original text. The husband of one wife... It actually means a one-woman man at a time, one woman at a time in your life. Now, if you have a tendency to have three and four girlfriends and you're single, you don't need to be preaching in a pulpit leading a people. It doesn't say, it doesn't mean when it says the husband and wife, that's another mistranslation. A one-woman man, vigilant, sober, of good behavior... The word good behavior is the word cosmos. It comes from the word cosmos. Your behavior has to be arranged in a godly, orderly fashion. There has to be an arrangement in your life, in your behavior. Can you see this? And I'm bringing out all of this so you can see that world in John 3, 16, cosmos means the great orderly arrangement of God, and he doesn't love everybody in the world. He only so loves the orderly arrangement of mankind. He's got a certain people in the orderly arrangement of mankind that he loves, and he'll chasten and scourge every one of those because those are his children. And the rest don't get the scourge of God. Now let's get further into this. For God so, or in this fashion, here's the way this ought to read. Let me erase some of this. Here's how this ought to read. Let me write it down the way it actually says it, or it implies it in the Greek language. We have never, I don't think I've ever done this. Let's just write it down. John 3.16. 3, 16. For God, in this fashion, so, that's what that means. In this fashion, gave His commandments. To His 
children. That is, that is what the word loved means. Loved. Agape. He gave his children in this world, in this orderly arrangement. And remember, the children are the ones that he has placed there in Ephesians 1 and 5. He has adopted us or placed sons by the will of Christ. And that's children that have ears and they can hear. For God in this fashion so gave his commandments to his children, that's agape, in this orderly arrangement, world, world, that whosoever, I'm going to show you what I'm going to do with whosoever. I hate that word. I mean, if I had a red marker, I'd put, I'd put a circle around it like that. No whosoever. The word is, the word whosoever, what is it? Pos ho. Pos ho. That the all. Let me put all this in. Parentheses, that the all, the all, pas ho, the, the all, pas, all is singular. There is a singular all. I've said before, what does it take to make the all? Well, it takes all of the sheep in the fold, doesn't it? That's what it takes. That's good. It's the sum of the whole. It's, if you've got, you got a fold, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 10, 88, 89, 90, 99, 100. You've got 100 sheep in the fold. And one goes out here on the field far away, on the hill far away. The shepherd leaves a man in charge, and the shepherd is Christ, and he goes out here to the world, and he finds that sheep... But when the sheep is lost, the sheep doesn't become a goat. It's a lost sheep, and the shepherd owns it, doesn't he? In Luke 19 and 10, the Scripture says, The Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Not one of his sheep will perish. He owns them. Look at Matthew, the first chapter. Matthew, he owns them. He doesn't want everybody. He only gave himself for the all. The is singular, and all is masculine gender. There's a particular specific all of mankind. Jesus didn't die for everyone. I hate the word whosoever because it's not whosoever. In the original Greek text, it's the all. It's everything it takes to make the complete whole. It's all the sheep. It's all the pieces of a pie. You slice a pie into six slices. It takes all six slices to make the whole of the pie. It, what's, it's the components. You can't have it. Somebody says, I like to say this TV. Uh, and... Uh, now, there's one thing wrong with it. It is a TV, but it doesn't have a picture, too. That's not a TV. Is it? No. It's just parts of something. To make the all of a TV, it takes all of that schematic in the back and all of those parts and, uh, that they have to go into and check each one of them. It takes each one of those little circuits. Yeah, that's the way to put it. And what are those little things, the little resistors and transistors? It takes all of that. You can't say, there's a TV, but I'd like to keep this one transistor. I, I just have an affinity for that. But I'm going to say the TV, and 
I'm not going to tell you what part it is because I'm going to give you a little game let you guess on that. It's not a TV without this transistor. It's the all. It takes all of the components to make the whole. It takes all of the sheep. That's the same word, that pos, the same word that Jesus used in John 6, 37. Look at it. John 6. Oh, Matthew 1. I didn't get, oh, I didn't finish that. Well, I, we'll go to John 6, 37 in a minute. He owns them. Yeah, Matthew, the first chapter. Here's a good, not a Christmas verse, a good birth of Christ verse. We don't believe in the Christ message it's Roman Catholicism. Now look here. Verse 21, she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his. Now, it actually says in the original text, the people of him. And him is the word A-U-T-O-U. It is genitive case. Genitive case means the people are possessed by Christ's self. Auto means self. They're possessed by Christ's self. He's not coming to save just anybody that wants to come. He owns these people. They belong to him, and that's all he's going to save. That's the elect, isn't it? Huh? Okay. First Peter 2. All right. Yeah, I don't mind throwing in extra verses. First Peter 2. <coughs> Now, this is, uh, this is an example of Christ leaving his commission to us. For ye were as sheep going astray. When a sheep is astray, who does it belong to? When a sheep comes to the knowledge of the truth, did it used to be a goat? Is God's ability to call his elect in, is that when he goes, poof, you're no longer a goat, you're a sheep. And it's like one of those cartoons where it goes boing and, and it just changed from, uh, it was an old cartoon about some monster following Bugs Bunny around. Every once in a while to go boing and that's what people think. Did you ever see that? A famous old cartoon from back in the 40s. I saw it when I was a little kid and I've seen it on TV since then. And he just goes boing, boing, and he changes back and forth to this little old man. And now boing, people think that that's the way God brings sheep to truth. They think you're a goat, boing, you became a sheep. That's not true. All lost sheep belong to the shepherd. Don't they? And that's all that he's going to get. That's what he says here in John 6, 37. Isn't it? He's not going to get everybody. He's going to get the all. There's a particular all. John 6. John 6. God and God knows his sheep. John six, verse thirty-seven. And while you're at it, turn to Second Timothy. Hold your place there, and and look at Second Timothy. We'll get both of these. Second Timothy, the second chapter. Second Timothy two. Now John six, verse thirty-seven. All, pos, masculine, gender, singular. That's the word, word in John 3, 16. For God so loved pos, ho, the all. Pos, that the Father giveth me. All that the Father giveth me. One complete whole that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And he that cometh to me, I'll in no wise cast out. Now, the Lord knows his sheep, doesn't he? 
He knows where they are, and he knows how to call every one of men to him. Look at verse 39. And this is the Father's will which has sent me. Notice Jesus doesn't have free will, especially from verse 38. He said, I came, not down, I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing. God knows who his sheep are. He's not going to lose any of his sheep. He's not willing that any of us should perish. Not one of us will perish, but all of us will come to repentance. And I'm going to get to that later. Look at 2 Peter 3. 2 Timothy 3. 2 Timothy, I'll get it right. I mean, 2. I'll get it. I was thinking of 2 Peter 3, 9. That's where I was. 2 Timothy 2, verse 19. Nevertheless, even it matters not that Hymenaeus and Philetus were teaching false doctrine. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. He knows who his sheep are. Not one's going to get away from him. And then he gives you an imperative command. Let every one of them that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and of earth, some to honor and some to dishonor. Now God's got vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. Those are vessels of dishonor, and he's got vessels of mercy which he hath afore prepared to glory. That's vessels of honor there in in Romans 9, 22 and 23. 21. 21. If a man be therefore, if a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor. Separate yourself from these vessels of dishonor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, prepared unto every good work. And then he tells you all the things to flee. Fully useful lust, follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Now, God is not going to lose his sheep because he only so loved, he only, God in this fashion gave his commandments, that's loved, to this orderly arrangement, that's the word world, that the all, that believe in him. That's the composite of the whole. Mike, how much time do I have? I don't know if I can go. 23. All right. Let's go over to 2 Peter 3. God's got a family. They were chosen. That is the all. There's, you realize, y'all realize, there is an exact number of people that God knew in the kingdom before the world began. There is an exact number. I don't know if it's a million, 500,000 or 200 million, 600,000, 371 or, but when the last sheep, and that's not very many people, 260 million people, 250 million in America is only 4.6% of the world's population in the world today. Uh, maybe about 4.2 since the world's multiplying faster than we are. 4.2, 4.3. And if you take in all the people that's ever lived, the United States is going to be 2% or less than the world's population. And that would be 260 million people. So if, 200, if everybody in the United States of America believe the truth and were born again and they were elect of God, it would be just around 2% of the world that's ever lived. 
Do you actually think that maybe 260 million people that believe God? When the Bible says few will find the narrow gate, there's going to be few. And unless God picked a man to go through the narrow gate and go through tribulation and trials, he's not going to heaven when he dies. There's no innocent way out of this. You have to go through the fire, no matter your age, no matter who you are. Without the fire, you're not going to heaven one day when you die. That's all there is to it. And you have to be in the fold, and you have to be among the sheep. Don't you? Now, let's look at second. Now, God doesn't just know his sheep. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning. Before I read this to you, I've got to give you another verse over here in John 10. I've got to give you a verse in John 10 before we go to 2 Peter 3. Let's go to back to John 10 because this is real important at this point. John 10. This is the parable of the good shepherd. And the good shepherd has a certain amount of sheep in the fold. <coughs> Chapter 10. Look here in verse 1. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. Now, that sounds like a real you know, pretty uh, words, doesn't it? Well, that had a meaning to it back in that day and time. Now, the shepherd is not a wolf. The shepherd is not a thief, and the under-shepherds are not thieves and wolves. But the thieves break into the fold from outside, somewhere outside the fold. They're not a part of the fold. God's not inviting these liars to come into the fold. Back in that day and time, some of the writers tell us that shepherds felt secure in numbers. And they would take five or ten uh, shepherds with their flocks of sheep and they would build a, a large sheep fold and it might enclose five acres and at night and they had an opening right here right there and at night they would build these this fold up with all kinds of stone high stones and then they would put a, uh, briars on top of the stones. And they would put watchmen so that if anyone tried to climb over, and those thorns over there, they had thorns, huge thorns. And when they would, it would be like razor wire in these prisons. And if a man tried to climb over to come in and steal the sheep, he certainly was not a part of the fold or part of the flock or part of the shepherds or part of the sheep. That's what he's talking about. Well, in the evening, one shepherd would go over here, and he'd bed down with his sheep here, another one up here, one here, all his sheep, one over here, one over here, one here. And the oldest shepherd, the oldest shepherd among the, the shepherds, he was the wisest. He was the most savvy. He knew more what was going on. He knew the ways of the wolves out here. He knew the ways of the thieves and the robbers. And he would put his sheep close to the door by him. And the oldest shepherd was in charge. They always put the oldest man, the wisest. And the oldest shepherd, they had a doorway here, but they didn't have a door on hinges. It didn't open. The oldest shepherd was called the door. That's what he was called. <laughs> Isn't that great? And he would lie down in that open place, open space there. He lied down, and he would touch one side of the door. This is a picture of Christ. And the preachers are just the under shepherds. He'd lie down in the doorway. His feet would touch one side of the doorway and his hair against the other, and he would sleep there at night with one eye open, saying, I dare the wolf to come and try to get in here. He said, you have to go through me. That's what Jesus said. And there's a certain number of sheep in God's sheepfold. And as he lay there, he would have some kind of dagger in one hand and his rod in another hand. 
Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. The rod of the shepherd was a, they would take a small sapling that, and it had roots going down. They'd take a small sapling, cut it off close to the ground, pull it up, cut the roots off, and it was a long rod. And they would cut it and have this, they'd put pieces of hobnail in that. When David said, I killed a lion and a bear, he meant that he beat the lion and the bear to death with that hobnail rod. That's what he's talking about. This is the picture that's being painted for us here in this 10th chapter. John, let's read. Verse 2, But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, that's the doorkeeper, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name. In the Middle East, the writers tell us that you could take an old Bedouin Arab shepherd, he knew every sheep by name. One was even said, according to one writer, they blindfolded him, They brought to him his sheep in the dark at night, and he felt his sheep and touched them, and he knew them by name. That's Christ. He knows us. And he leadeth them out. We go in and out and find pasture. Where do we go? Well, they would go out on a plateau. They called that a table. We see a lot of those out west, but they'd have a table land. David said, Thou preparest a table for me in the presence of my enemies. We're talking about God's sheep. Not one will perish. When you go out on a table land, sometimes before the spring, and there'd be all kinds of varmints around this table land. I, you can't draw it the way it is. It might be like... And he would take a place on that table land, and he would go up here, and he'd clean it out, clean all the, all the old debris out. He would go in there and plant him a good, he'd run off the varmints, and plant him a good, a good uh, field of fescue of some kind for the sheep to eat. And then he would bring them out there in the springtime. And when David said, he prepares a table for me in the presence of mine enemies, the enemies were all around the table. And he prepared it for them. And that's what he's doing for us. Where was I? And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them. And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. The sheep. Goats don't follow him. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. In the morning... When all these shepherds would get up, each one of them had some kind of noise that he would make. They'd get up and make some, and that one shepherd would make make a sound, and only his sheep would get up and rise in the morning and follow him out the, the, the gate. The rest of them would sit there until they heard the voice of their shepherd. They knew the voice. So they would follow him out to find pasture. We are the sheep of his pasture. He's not saving goats. This is not a biological miracle. Not one of his sheep. He died for the all. That's all he died for. A stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. And you didn't, have, you didn't drive sheep like these guys in these big fancy churches. They would go before the sheep, and because they loved the sheep, the sheep would follow them. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were that he spoke unto them. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door. What a wonderful, magnificent picture. He is the mighty shepherd. He'll not lose one. 
He's come to seek and to save the lost sheep, not the goats, the all of his flock. And all that came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. Hear, akuo, the hearing ear. God hath made the hearing ear, Proverbs 20 and 12. And we only hear the voice of our shepherd. True believer can't go into one of these fancy uptown churches and listen to the free will lie and hear it. They will not. They know something's wrong and they'll hop around from one church to the other. I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved by the door. If any man hear, who's going to hear? The elect. And shall go in and out and find pasture. <coughs> the thief cometh not but for to kill, to steal, and destroy. I am come that they might have life. Who might have life? Sheep, not goats. The all. And that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd was the main shepherd. He was also called the door. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep, but he that is an hireling and not the shepherd whose own the sheep are not, he sees the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth because he is an hireling and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and I know of mine. My sheep know me. As the Father knoweth me, even so I the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. I don't lay my life down for the goats. I lay my life down for the elect. I lay my life down for my wife, the all. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, that's the Gentiles, not Mormons. God, not even going to go into that right now. That's the Gentile church. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice. Is the Gentile church hearing the voice of God? Because we have hearing ears. He that hath an ear to hear, hear this. <coughs> and there should be one fold and one shepherd. He's going to bring everything together in one, according to Ephesians, the first and second chapter, the Jew and the Gentile, and make one new man. That's what he says. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it up again. They killed Jesus. They had God ordained this murder of Jesus by the hands of evil men. But it was by the will of Christ and by the will of the Father. It pleased God to bruise him. God killed Jesus. No man taketh it from me. I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. Verse 24, Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to the doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. What idiots. Plainly, guess what that word is? Parisia. P-A-R-R-H-E-S-I-A. It means blunt. Be blunt with us. Don't beat around the bush. And Jesus said, let's sing just as I am and see if you'll come. And sing 25 verses and maybe you goats will come. That's not what he said. Jesus answered them, I told you plainly. Well, he just told them over in previously in chapter 8, didn't he? Your father's the devil. He's a liar and a murderer and so are you. I like what he said in chapter 8 in verse... 47, he that is of God heareth God's words. Heareth. Who's going to hear? The ones who have ears to hear that God wakens their ears. And the ones that he deafens and blinds, they won't hear because they're vessels of wrath. They are the rest. Ye Pharisees. How's this for plain How's this two chapters before for plain speech in the same, here you are at the same period of time. Ye therefore hear them not because ye are not of God. That's about as plain as you can get, isn't it? He said, I told you plainly, you don't belong to me. Isn't that what he said? Go back to John 10. 
Verse 25, Jesus answered them, I told you plainly. And I'm not going inviting you in. You're a vessel of wrath. You're a potter. You're a piece of pottery that I'm making to dishonor. That's your purpose. You're perfected in that. And then he tells them, You believe not the works that I do in my Father's name. They bear witness of me. In verse 26, he tells you why men don't believe God. But ye believe not because ye are not of the all. You're not of my sheep. You're not part of the all. Isn't that what he's saying? You're not part of the all, as I said unto you. I told you that my sheep hear my voice. They have hearing ears to hear. I've deafened your ears, given you eyes you can't see and ears you can't hear, lest you should be converted and I should heal you. I don't want to heal you because I've got a purpose for you in being a vessel of wrath. You're fitted for destruction and I'm going to get to show my anger and fury and power on your destruction. That's your purpose. My sheep hear my voice. I know them. And they follow me. And where did he get his sheep? (laughs) He, he, He got them from the Father. Jesus said, I pray not for the world there in John 17. I pray for those whom thou hast given me, Father. Verse 28, I give them eternal life. I give sheep eternal life. I don't give goats eternal life. This is the all, isn't it? And they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck any one of them out of my hand. I will not lose any of them. Verse 29, my father which gave them me, My Father gave me to them, is what he's saying. Is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one in agreement. That's what it actually means. We agree that they belong to me, and I won't lose any of them. There is a particular all. And it's a singular all, and it's everything that it takes to make that up. And that is the word world in John 3, 16, the all. Huh? That's what? It is a comfort. It's a comfort to the elect. Yeah, Mary? Oh. Well, there's several stories about the sheep that stray. Sometimes... They, the shepherd had the problem, and this is our shepherd. There would be one sheep that would lead all the other sheep astray, and he would, have, he would keep on leading the sheep astray and taking them. And he was a sheep. And he would take them over beyond the boundary and take them off over there and get them off. He'd be kind of a leader, renegade sheep. He'd lead them astray, and he kept doing it until finally one day the shepherd had to kill that sheep. And God says, if you're a preacher of the word and you're out here or you're a leader among the flock and you keep leading the sheep astray, you may be a sheep, but just like King Saul, I will kill you. Then one of the sheep would go astray. Sometimes some of the little baby lambs would just wander off and just... The, Mr. Keller tells us, Philip Keller says that the He says that if you had a shepherd, there would be four or five, maybe six, that would stay real close to the shepherd all the time. And then you had most of the sheep were just wandering around out here in the fold. And then once in a while, you had a sheep that would just wander off over here and just wander off by himself. And the shepherd would go out there, and he would know where he was, and that, that little baby sheep would constantly go out there and become cast. Sometimes it would be an older sheep. They'd become cast. And cast was where they would lie down on their back. They'd be looking for a comfortable place. Maybe they had too much wool. It's a picture of us, of us having too many things. 
and the sheep would lay down in a sandy spot, a little hole, and just wander until finally its feet went straight up in the air. And that was called cast. David said, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. And when a sheep would become cast, there were certain gases. One of the writers tells us that would get into a part of the sheep called the rumen. And he said this gas would kill the sheep if he lay cast. Very, this, these gases would kill the sheep if he lay cast very long. And if he laid there, and even if he didn't die from that, the wolf would come. That's what the Scripture's talking about. The Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. We have a mighty shepherd, and he's going to get to us before the wolf gets there, before we die. He'll not lose any of us. Jesus died for the all of the sheep. Sometimes when they, I know many of you heard the story, but if a shepherd had one little baby sheep that would, sometimes they'd wander off and they'd just get off out there and get in danger. And this is what God's done to me. Get off out there and sin after a, a lamb would do that so long. The shepherd would pick that lamb up and he'd take his legs and he'd break them. And then he would... And that sheep hurt him. He would bind the, bind the, uh, the broken bone, put a splint on it, put a sling around his neck, and carry that baby sheep until it healed. And that baby sheep, from then on, learned not to leave the shepherd. God's broken all four of my legs and carried me for a long time. God's got a, he's, the whole point of the all of John 3, 16, it's the flock. It's the same words of 2 Peter 3 and 9. He is not willing that any of us should perish. I don't have time to go through that. Am I out of time? I definitely don't have time to go through it. I've got a lot more things to say on John. John 3, 16, the all is about the flock. It's not whosoever will can come in. If you're a goat and you don't really, and you weren't chosen by God, but if you want to get in, where's that will going to come from? Let's pray. God, teach us. You are a shepherd. These are the things you do to us when we wander off. But thank God. God, we praise you that we're in the all of the flock. Lord, you put us through trials, but we know those are the things we have to do as we follow you in order to become closer to you. Deal with our hearts. Teach us that we're just sheep, just ignorant, stupid, dumb sheep. We don't even know what to do with our lives. But when we hear your voice, we do follow. Thank you for the truth. Thank you for predestination. It's our comfort, Lord, to know that when we go through these things, it's your will. We thank you for them. And God will continue to praise you. We give you glory in Christ's name. Amen.